Hey guys, welcome back to That Florida Feeling. How's your week been? Mine's pretty good. It's been warm here. It's gonna rain tomorrow. Uh, the storms are coming through. If you dealt with those storms early in the week, I hope everybody's okay. I heard the panhandle got hit a little bit between the fires and the tornadoes. It's just been it's not good for them up there right now. Just keep them in your good thoughts. Do you guys see the new logo? Is that not amazing? I love it. Uh, big shout out to Whack Artwork for creating me. You can follow him on Instagram and Twitter. If you look him up, he is at W-A-C-K Artwork. And he does a lot of 80s stuff and retro. And he's just an amazing artist. You should definitely give him a shout out. He does more than just logos for podcasters like me. He took my vision and made it something amazing. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, you are an amazing artist. Thank you for helping me see my vision through. Thanks, you guys, for participating in the logo Instagram poll and the Facebook question about it. Uh, you guys are awesome. I'm glad everybody loves it as much as I do. I, I love the little flamingo and the sunshine. I think it's just great. It's just so Florida to me. Maybe one day we'll get some stickers and T-shirts going, hopefully someday soon. Um, Thanks to everybody who listened to the last episode about haunted places in Florida. I thought it was just a fun episode. I know that um, a lot of people are in the paranormal, and I thought it would be just another fun episode to do. I learned some new places to check out on Creepy Nights. Maybe you did too, uh, especially the Dry Tortugas. Can't wait to head out there again. So today's topic actually comes from Mallory. So Mallory, if you hear this, if you actually listen, <laughs> thank you. Uh, for this topic, you reminded me of one of the darker spots in Florida's history. And I feel that this is something that either people don't talk about or actually haven't even heard about. So I definitely wanted to give its own episode and do it some proper justice. Have you guys ever heard of Rosewood? It's a town in Levy County, Florida, which is on the Gulf side. It's a few hours North of Tampa. Uh, the county was actually created in excuse me, 1845. After the Seminole War, and, I mean, it's obviously still a county today. Currently, it only has a population of maybe 40,000 people. The county seat's actually in Bronson, and the largest county is Wilston. Uh, So, basically, by all just outward appearances, this just seems like another county in Florida. Uh, The only thing different about Levy County is that it's home to Rosewood. And Rosewood, Florida has definitely has a spot in Florida history, not for good reasons. Rosewood, Florida is an unincorporated community that is located just off of State Road 24. It's about one mile northeast of Sumner and maybe nine to ten miles northeast of Cedar Key. So we're talking about like in the bend part of Florida. And Rosewood actually got its name from the reddish color of cut cedar wood, which was very important to the area's economy. Um, Lots of industry involving uh, foresting and things like that um, in that area at the time. Now, Rosewood was an African-American community in the early 20th century, and it was there until about 1923. And initially, Rosewood was settled by both whites and blacks, and the area was heavily forested at one time with cedar trees, hence how it got its name. Um, Unfortunately, the area was pretty well cut down and dried out. By about 1890, um, they had cut them all down and sent sent all the trees to the mills. The mill in the area was actually a pencil mill, and it even closed before 1900. So, due to these changes in the area and jobs, the population changed about that time, and most of the whites moved their residents to Sumner. And so, by 1900, Rosewood was a predominantly black community, whereas Sumner was a predominantly white community. And the two communities or villages had really good relations as both continued to grow. Now, Rosewood grew to its max population of about 355 people. And this was sometime around 1915. And it actually stayed about that population up until about 1923. And, of course, as the town's population grew and changed, the economy changed with the mills opening and closing and changing, uh, ever-changing, due to just the way that florida itself was changing Uh, and it obviously changed a lot since its founding in 1845 now rosewood had two really influential families and those were the goans and the carriers and the goans family were really responsible for some of their economy they brought the turpentine industry to the area and it really became 
huge in that area. A lot of people had jobs. They're both blacks and whites. And the Goins also became one of the largest landowners in Levy County at the at the time, or at one time. And of course, the families continued to grow, and they felt that they were pressured there, so they actually ended up moving to Gainesville later on um, to continue their business. Now, the other family I mentioned, the Carriers, they were just as influential and mostly known for their logging in the area. And so these two families were really a stable in the community, and the community continued to become very close-knit. And probably by the 1920s, uh, most of the community was related to each other in one way or another. And, of course, everybody knew everybody. Now, this community was subject to the normal southern bullshit going on in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And so Florida had, of course, no exception, had passed the laws, and they had called them the Black Codes. And basically, it's disenfranchised black citizens, which is not okay. Um, the laws were passed as political parties were influenced by white supremacists and, of course, paid politicians. Now, the black codes were actually eventually overturned, and the black citizens got to enjoy a brief period of improved social standings, but it didn't last long. Um, the Florida legislature uh, actually passed a poll tax in 1885, which was one way to disenfranchise poor voters. If you couldn't afford to vote, then you couldn't vote, so you didn't count. And basically, this effectively meant that black voters lost mostly all of their political power and their rights with it. Uh, they lost the right to vote. They lost the right to serve on juries, to run for offices, and this gave them no political avenues in the state. None. A governor, Napoleon Bonaparte Broward, which, by the way, what a name. What the heck, people. Um, but Governor Napoleon Bonaparte Broward even suggested in the early 1900s that the blacks should just leave the state altogether. Doesn't he sound like a wonderful human being? The other thing that really had his foothold in Florida was the Ku Klux Klan, uh, which obviously didn't help tensions at the time of the state. Um, the Klan began to rise to power after 1915, and they even had a stronghold in Jacksonville and Tampa. Now remember, Rosewood is not far from Tampa. The club even grew so strong in Florida that the Miami chapter used to hold meetings at the Miami Country Club. Let that sink in. Huh. Florida has had imposed legal racial segregation under the Jim Crow laws by this time. And, of course, the law required segregating blacks and whites, public facilities, and transportation. And blacks and whites basically created their own community centers. Uh, they created an area where they felt comfortable. And by 1920, the community of Rosewood was pretty self-sufficient. It was actually doing really well for itself. The town had three churches, a school, a messianic hall, a turpentine mill, a sugarcane mill, two general stores. Side note, one of those stores was owned by a white man a post office, and even a train depot on the Florida Railroad. They also had a baseball team named the Rosewood Stars. So the community was actually doing rather well. They actually had about a dozen or so two-story wooden plank homes, some small two-room houses, and of course several small unoccupied plank farms and storage structures that helped to make up this town. And the town was wealthy, uh, with some families actually owning symbols of middle-class prosperity at the time that would include pianos, organs, and very nice furniture. So Rosewood was actually doing rather well. Um, and it was a happy and steady community up until 1923 when everything went up in a blaze of lies and anger. Um, if Rosewood sounds familiar, Rosewood is the place of the Rosewood Massacre that happened the first week of January in 1923 in Florida. The massacre is called as such because six black people and two white people were killed. But eyewitness accounts suggest that the death toll should be closer to 27 or even up to 150. Unfortunately, we'll never know the actual true count. The entire town of Rosewood was razed to the ground except for one general store. Um, or house. And the town is still in ruins. Um, it was destroyed and in today we would call that a race riot. Uh, back then they called it something much worse. And these riots were happening all over Florida, and they largely went unchecked in the state because law enforcement just didn't want to step in to help. Now, the area around Rosewood was a pretty unsettled area because Florida had a high number of lynchings of black men in the years leading up to the massacre, and that includes a well-publicized one in December of 1922, just basically a month earlier. And violence was common at the time. Uh, the town though, had been 
mostly untouched, uh, and they were a quiet town, and they stuck to themselves, which is what they wanted. And everything went good until one day. And the problems began when white men from several nearby towns um, lynched a black Rosewood resident because of an accusation that a white woman in Sumner had been assaulted by a black drifter. This woman, Fanny Taylor, was 22 at the time in 1923, and she was married to James Taylor, and they lived in Sumner with their two young children. Now, James was a hardworking man. He worked at the mill, and he left for work early every day, which meant that Fanny was left at home alone all day. Um, James would leave early in the morning when it was dark, and he would get home late in the day. And Fanny was known to be aloof, kind of peculiar, um, didn't really get to know a lot of people. No one really could tell you much about her. And on January 1st, 1923, the Taylor's neighbors reported hearing screaming from the house. So the neighbors armed themselves and ran over there since it was still dark out and they weren't sure what they were going to find. And they came to her rescue. And when they came to her rescue, they found Fanny bruised and beaten with scuffs all over her clean white floors. Side note, I think it's really funny that that is an eyewitness. There were scuffs on her clean floors. Really? Okay. Anyways, Taylor was screaming for help and for someone to get her baby. They asked her what was wrong, and she told them that a white man was in her house, and he had come through the back door, and he had assaulted her. Now, the neighbors found the baby, but they didn't find anyone else in the house. When they further asked her what happened, she stated that she was assaulted but not raped. But this is not what spread around. You ever played the game Telephone? You say something, you tell someone else, they tell someone else. By the time the fifth person's heard it, it's not even close to what it started as. This is what happened. Rumors circulated like wildfire. And it was widely believed by the whites that she was raped and robbed, none of which she said. So they got upset. The charge of rape of a white woman by a black man was basically equivalent to murder in the South, especially so close to the Civil War. You have to remember, the country was still healing. This was right at this was at the end of the Reconstruction period. There were still bad tensions, and this did not help the area. And the worst part about this, though, is the day before she was attacked, the KKK had held a rally in Gainesville that, that included a burning cross and a banner that said, First and always, protect womanhood. I'm not saying it's convenient, and I'm not saying she wasn't attacked, but I'm saying that, that that's just bad timing on all parts. Now, the rumor circulated, and it didn't take long for a posse to form thanks to Levy County Sheriff Robert Elias Walker, and an investigation was started. In this investigation, they found that a chain gang member, Jesse Hunter, had escaped, and he was automatically their first suspect in Mrs. Taylor's assault. The posse came from Cedar, Creek, Cedar Key, Otter Creek, Chief Land, and Bronson to help with the search, and as the rumor spread, it only got worse. What started as a small posse gained over 400 men to find this man who was the attacker. The group even got a hold of dogs that they were going to use to search for the suspect. The dogs led them to the house of Aaron Carrier, Sarah Carrier's nephew, where they tied him to a car and took him to Sumner. Carrier was put in protective custody in Bronson by Sheriff Walker, who had a moment of clarity and told the posse to go home as many of them had been drinking and this was not going to solve anything. The sheriff also realized the situation and told the mill workers to stay at the mill. Do not go home because he was worried for their safety. The posse didn't listen to the sheriff, though, and they seized Sam Carter, a local blacksmith and teamster from the turpentine still. They tortured him until he admitted to hiding the escaped chain gang prisoner. They forced him to show where he was hidden, but of course the dogs couldn't find um, his scent. By the way, sorry, no, it's not thundering. My cat's just decided to have a freak out moment. The posse then, to the shock of witnesses, shot Carter in the face, fatally wounding him. They then hung Carter's body from a tree as a symbol to other blacks in the area that they were taking this very seriously. The members of the mob even took his clothes as souvenirs. I hope when those members had a moment of clarity that they realized how fucked up that was. Now, people think that Hunter fled to Rosewood after he escaped with the hopes that he would be safe. Well, the mob continued on, even after Sheriff Walker had told them to stand down and go home, but they didn't listen. They continued together in larger numbers, and by the evening of January 4th, the mob started to arm themselves and realized that they needed to go to Rosewood. 
But of course, the first place they went was the home of Sarah Carrier. And the home was filled with 15 to 25 people seeking refuge during this turmoil. They didn't know what to do, and they were scared. And there were children hiding upstairs under the mattresses. And not just one, but many. And the children were there for their safety, and some because they were visiting their grandmother for the Christmas holidays. They were also there because they knew that they would be protected by Sylvester Carrier, and possibly two other men. Carrier, though, was the only one armed against the mob. He was known around Wo- Rosewood as being a formidable character, an expert hunter, a music teacher, and a crack shot. He wasn't liked by the whites in the area because he didn't take crap. Now, the men went to visit him first because the rumors were circulating that he had said an attack on Miss Taylor was, quote, an example of what Negroes could do without interference. They didn't have any proof of him saying this. And for some reason, I don't really think he did say this. I think that he was a scapegoat. And I think that they were just idiots. And they also thought that he was still hiding an escaped prisoner that only added to this fire. Now, they don't know who shot first. And by the way, I thought about making a very bad timed poorly timed star wars joke but i'm not going to because this is serious um they don't know who shot first but after two members of the mob went up to their house someone shot and sarah carrier was shot in the head um a child in the house minnie lee langley came downstairs at the noise and the commotion and by the way she was the same child who was at their house when they dragged out um aaron carrier uh, out of the house a few days earlier the one that they took to Bronson and was put into custody. She was there when that happened. Now, Sylvester saw her come down and put her in a fire closet, which is basically a cupboard to put your firewood in, and he was going to protect her. And she recalled what she saw that day, saying that when the cracker, Polly Wilkinson, Wilkerson, broke down the door, old Sly let him have it. And shots rang out, and they continued to be exchanged, and the house was riddled with bullets, but they never took the house. The standoff actually lasted until the next morning when they finally entered and they found Sarah and Sylvester Carrier dead in the house. They also found several other wo- others wounded, including a children. They found Polly Wilkerson and Hen- Henry Andrews, both white, both very dead. They found another four men fatally wounded. And the remaining children had been spirited away into the woods behind the house to be carefully gathered away from Rosewood. This was serious, and now they were going into hiding. Of course, the news about the standoff at the Carrier House reached all the parts of the state of Florida, which meant white men from all over were going to come to Rosewood. The reports were carried in the St. Petersburg Independent, Florida Trans Union, Miami Herald, and the Miami Metropolis, all with different facts and versions of the story. The Metropolis carried that 20 black people and four white people were dead, and clearly characterized this as a race war. The incident even made front-page news across the U.S., The incident was described by the Washington Post as a band of heavily armed Negroes and a Negro desperado. And they were all involved in this situation. The information came via discreet messages from Sheriff Walker, mob rumors, eyewitness accounts, and other embellishments from part-time reporters that were sent to the Associated Press. The details about the armed standoff were particularly explosive as it was put by one historian, Thomas Dye, that the ideas of blacks in Rosewood would take up arms against white, white men was just absolutely unthinkable in the Deep South. Now, the newspaper, the black newspaper, had a different angle on it. The Afro-American out of Baltimore highlighted the acts as heroism against savages. It even said that the two Negro women were raped and brutalized between Rosewood and Sumner because of sexual lust of brutalized white mobs. Okay. Everybody has their own story to tell. But none of these purports actually stopped the mob or did anything to the mob. And the mob continued as they moved through Rosewood, and they burned black churches. Lee Ruth Davis reports hearing the bells ringing even as they were inside setting fire to the church. And the mob didn't discriminate. They didn't. They even burned a white church in Rosewood. They were burning everything. The black residents of the town fled to to the swamps for safety. Some were only clothed in their pajamas as they left in the early hours of the morning. Wilson Hall, who was nine at the time of the attack, recalls his mother waking him to escape into the swamps at the early morning. And he said that he could see headlights from white men approaching for miles. The Hall family actually ended up walking 15 miles through swampland to the town of Gulf Hammock. And survivors there recalled that it was uncharacteristically cold for Florida and that people actually suffered as they spent nights in the hammocks. By the way, hammocks are a raised wooded area. All to evade the mob. But there were some white families who were sympathetic and took in to help. 
Sam Carter, 69-year-old widow, hid in the swamp for two days until a sympathetic mail carrier drove her to Chiefland to be with her family. So there was a glimmer of hope in these bad days. But white men continued the mob mentality, and they would pour kerosene on the surrounding houses and light them on fire. And then they would pick off whoever emerged. Lexi Gordon, a light-skinned 50-year-old woman who was ill with typhoid fever, had sent her children into the woods to escape. She, however, did not escape. She was killed by a shotgun blast when she emerged from hiding under her house as they had set it on fire and she was trying to escape the flames. Now, James Carrier, Sylvester's brother, who he had been paralyzed from a stroke, he actually hid in the swamps before seeking protection from Mr. Pillsbury. Mr. Pillsbury, we'll come into our story later, but he was the white turpentine supervisor mill. Ooh, said that wrong. White supervisor at the turpentine mill. Now, Mr. Pillsbury took James in and locked him in his house. But the mob didn't stop. They found him anyways. They tortured him to find out if he had aided in the fugitive, still believed to be the attacker, forced him to dig his own grave, and then shot him. There were no stopping these people right now. And the mob didn't stop. They continued to grow. We're now at January 5th, and the mob reformed with two to 300 people. People are now coming from out of state. This is just unthinkable in the South. How could they do this? We've got to stop them. That's what they were thinking. Mingo Williams, who was near Bronson, about 20 miles away from Rosewood, was actually asked his name as he worked on the side of the road, only to be shot dead as soon as he answered. Sheriff Walker is now realizing the severity of all this and pleading with people to stop and to ask the news reports to covering this to send a message to Sheriff P.G. Ramsey in Alachua County to help him. He knew this was getting out of control. He knew this was already out of control and he needed to help. Carloads of people came from Gainesville to assist him. The only problem is, is that many of these people had attended the Klan rally earlier in the week. So you really didn't know what side they were on. And Mr. Pillsbury, he tried to keep black mill workers in Sumner to stay. He was also dissuading the white workers from joining the violence. He didn't want anyone to get hurt. He wanted this stopped as well. Armed guards were sent by Sheriff Walker to turn away black people as they emerged from the swamps. He didn't want them going back to Rosewood. He didn't want anyone else getting hurt. And Mr. Pillsbury's wife also started to smug, smuggle people out of the area. White men in Sumner realized how bad it was and even refused to join in any more violence or give out guns to the mob. Now, the governor, Kerry Hardy at the time, was ready to help with the National Guard. They were going to neutralize the situation if they had to. Walker declined their initial help. And Hardy took him at his word and decided to go on a hunting trip instead of taking this seriously. Sounds like a wonderful man. <laughs> January 6th brought another day of hell to Rosewood. But it also saw the evacuation of some black residents to Gainesville by two white conductors, John and William Bryce. Now, John and William Bryce knew the residents of Rosewood from trading them with the area. These were two wealthy men from Cedar Key. They owned a train because they were independently wealthy. And they knew that they needed to help. So they took their private train and they slowed as they got to the area. And they blew their horns as women and children ran from the swamps. They refused to pick up any of the black men, citing more mob mentality. But they were all willing and happy to help the women and children. So they did. They took them. The people hidden in the general store by John and Mary Jo Wright were also able to get on the train. Many white residents of Sumner also hid black residents of Rosewood and smuggled them to Gainesville. By January 7th, the mob of 100 to 150 people returned to Rosewood and burned the remaining structures. The town is now gone. Now, people were alarmed at the actions in Levy County. Uh, Governor Hardy even called for a special grand jury to investigate this outbreak. This was the worst thing that had ever happened to Florida, and someone needed to be held responsible. So the all right jury listened to the testimony, but they found insufficient evidence to prosecute anyone for their crimes. The judge in the case found the mob actions to be deplorable, but couldn't do anything about it. And the end of the week saw the end of Rosewood. But it also meant the end of talking about Rosewood. The Chicago Defender, the most influential black newspaper in the U.S., reported 19 people died in this race war. A few editorials in Florida continued to summarize the events, and the Gainesville Daily Sun justified the actions of the white involved in the violence. The Tampa Tribune, though, called it a foul and lasting blot on the people of Levy County. I agree with the Tampa Tribune. Now, the northern newspapers were, point, were more than happy to point out how astonishingly little pro cultural progress had been made in some parts of the world. And the Nashville Banner even characterized the entire incident as deplorable. 
The official death toll was eight people. Six blacks and two whites. But people disagree on the number. I disagree on this number. Survivors claim as many as 27 black residents were killed. And they say that the newspapers didn't even report the correct number of white deaths. Do you remember Minnie Lee Langley who was in that cabinet? The child at the carrier's house while the massacre happened? She stated that she remembers stepping over many white bodies. Eyewitnesses also recall a plow coming to cover a mass grave of black residents that contained at least 26 people. The claims were investigated many years later, but they had waited too long. That meant the witnesses had disappeared, died, didn't remember, or didn't want to talk about it, and I can't say I blame them. Sarah Carrier's husband, Haywood, wasn't at Rosewood at the massacre, but he was away on a hunting trip, and he came back to discover his wife, his brother James, and his son Sylvester had been killed, and his house was destroyed by the mob. Haywood was said to have been broken by this incident. He stopped speaking to anyone but himself. He passed a year after the incident. His family said he died from grief. Jesse Hunter, the escaped convict that started all this, well, he was never found. And many people that escaped Rosewood, that fled, that made it, they changed their names. And they never came back to Rosewood again. Most of them didn't even talk about it again. And you remember Fanny Taylor and her husband that started all this? Well, they moved to another town. And she was said to be very nervous in her later years. She eventually died of cancer. And Rosewood, Rosewood was left with its pieces. And the only structure left in Rosewood was John Wright's house. John Wright was a man who helped smuggle people out of this town. He wanted them to live. And he lived in that house, and he acted as an emissary between the survivors and the county. And John helping meant that he was ostracized because he had helped. And it took its toll on him. He became an alcoholic and ultimately died after drinking too much one night out in Cedar Key. And he was buried in an unmarked grave in Sumner. So a heroic man had had a horrible fate. Now, before we talk about Rosewood now... I want to talk about Sarah Carrier again. Sarah Carrier has an interesting part to play in this story. And if someone had just listened to her, I feel that Rosewood would have turned out so different. And so many things would have been saved. Sarah Carrier was actually the Taylor's laundress. Uh, She was known among the white women as Aunt Sarah and respected. And Sarah Carrier told a different story about Fanny Taylor in that day. Now, Philomena Goins... Uh, told her story years later but she was with Sarah and then Sarah was her grandmother and she was with her on the day of the incident she was at the Taylor's house and they were working that day when they saw a white man leave by the back door but it wasn't early in the morning it was later in the morning it was about noon she said that Taylor did emerge from her home showing evidence that she had been beaten but it was well after that morning Um, Philomena's brother Arnett who had gone with Sarah so his grandmother to work a couple times before actually remembered seeing the white man before and carrier had told others in the black community what she had seen that day and so many people in rosewood actually believe that fanny taylor had a white lover she wasn't beaten by a black man she got into a fight with her lover and he beat her on the day of the incident now that doesn't excuse what fanny taylor did whether she did have a lover or it was a black man we don't have proof of either way but i really don't think that sarah Carrier would lie about this i can see how hard it would be to be a black person that time with no rights so why would you lie about a white woman i really think that this hot horrible incident might have happened because one woman was unfaithful to her husband and made up a story so that she wouldn't get caught it's just personal opinion but it certainly does look that way unfortunately we'll never know now, Rosewood has been largely forgotten and slipped into oblivion. And a lot of the survivors left in, with nothing and started over with nothing. And they just wanted to forget that horrible incident. So how did they deal with it? Silence. They didn't talk about it. They didn't speak about it. They didn't meet with each other about it. And except for oral tradition passed down through their own families, nobody knew of it. The family spoke of Rosewood, but they kept it to themselves. They didn't want the stories to be told. Philomena Goins would tell her children the story of Rosewood and what happened that day at the Taylors every Christmas just to keep the memories alive in her family. Now, Philomena had a son, Arnett Doctor, and Arnett was consumed by the story. He didn't want it to be forgotten. He didn't think it was fair. And the stories have slowly started to come out, especially as journalists have picked up on these stories. 
And Arnett Doctor actually went to a journalist about this story. He wanted this to be told. And Philomena actually disowned her son uh, when he talked to a journalist. And the journalist actually got it picked up by 60 Minutes for it to be told. They didn't want it to be forgotten. And the survivors who did talk about it, or, you know, wanted to, actually wanted to talk about it. There weren't that many. I looked it up. Um, they did do a story on it, but not a lot of people wanted to talk about it. And the ones who did actually credited their faith for getting through those events in life. But thanks to the families who still talk about it and the oral traditions and even Arnett Doctor, the stories have never been forgotten. The Rosewood Massacre, the ensuing violence, and the history that's come from it has never been forgotten. There was actually a hearing for compensation that gave $1.5 million to the survivors. And what's left of those stories were actually written in a book in 1996, a book called, like Judgment Day, The Ruin and Redemption of a Town Called Rosewood. I haven't found this book yet, but I intend fully on reading it. Um, the book actually went on to be a bestseller. So it's good that people aren't letting it just go away. And this story actually became a movie uh, called Rosewood. It was directed by John Singleton. And it was based on the historic events. Minnie Lee Langley, the one that survived the massacre, she actually served as a source for the set designer. And Arnett Doctor, the one that got the story back in the light, was actually a consultant based on his mother's stories. And he wanted to ensure that they have not been forgotten, and they, now they haven't. The state of Florida actually declares Rosewood a Florida Heritage Landmark in 2004. And there's even a state marker on Highway 24 that names the victims and ensures people sure that people know Rosewood did exist. Now, you can still find scattered structures remaining through the community, and that includes a church, a business, a couple homes, and, of course, John Wright's home. I don't know why John Wright's home has not been added to the list of historic places. I personally feel it should. If there's not a change.org petition, we need to make one. This is a story that never needs to be forgotten. Now, Mary Hall Daniels was the last known survivor at the time, and she died in Jacksonville on May 2nd, 2018. But it actually came out later that Vera Goins Hamilton, she was identified as a survivor, and she died at 100 in La Cucci, Florida in 2020. So the last survivor has just passed within the last two years. And the descendants formed the Rosewood Heritage Foundation and the Real Rosewood Foundation in order to educate people in Florida and around the world. <laughs> The Heritage Foundation travels as an exhibit that tours internationally in order to share about the massacre. They also have permanent displays at the Daytona Beach at the Bethune Cookman University. And the state of Florida has also established a Rosewood Family Scholarship in 2020 that pays up to 6,100 to 50 students each year who are descendants and the families of the families that went through hell that week and managed to survive. Now, I truly do hope Rosewood is never forgotten. They say that those who do not study history are doomed to repeat it. I hope that we never repeat this, ever. This is excusable, inexcusable, and we should never, ever do this again. Now, I know I always do a Florida man story, but today I'm not going to. I think we've heard enough stupidity in this entire podcast episode that we're not going to talk about anymore. Um, I think I'm going to end the episode by saying that we need to do better to one another. And just do something nice for someone else. Pass it forward. Pay it forward, whatever you want to call it. Be the reason somebody smiles today. I hope you guys have a great week. And I hope you have enjoyed your daily dose of sunshine.